When I was a kid, we went to a synagogue religiously three times a year, uh, Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah. And I remember uh, very distinctly these old-looking men with these very ancient-looking talesim prayer shawls over their heads. And basically, prayer sounded like this. Hallelujah. Kiddush. And, uh, and I, I actually thought as a child, all you have to do is say the first word of the page and the last word of the page, and then the rest you're, you just say... Um, <clears throat> I, what, I, what I didn't understand is that these men have the miraculous ability to say 3,221 words in 60 seconds. Um, what I also, uh, and then I, 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 they were actually saying the words, but I, I just didn't understand why not just uh, go to synagogue and say, God, you know what I said yesterday? Ditto for today. <laughs> And I actually thought, I never thought I'd be a rabbi, but I actually thought that rabbis go to school to learn how to call out page numbers. I said, I could do that. You know? <laughs> it seemed like that's all they do professionally. Please turn to page 19. Wow, that was really good. <laughs> how do you do that? Anyways, what I want to do with you is my, my favorite thing to do, one of my favorite things to do, is I want to go through the Shmona Esrei, the 18 benedictions with you. So I'm not going to talk uh, so much about, um, I mean, there's so much to say about prayer itself. I have a book called Soul Powered Prayers, uh, which you can get through Amazon. It's not here. And in that, pr in that book, I, I go through the 18 benedictions. And uh, it, it hit me. Uh, I'm, again, I'm not from a religious home. I began my journey back to Judaism when I was 18. And it was only maybe five years into my Torah career I realize I have no clue what I'm saying. <laughs> and, um, and, um, and it's really very sad uh, for me, but also I go to synagogue and I, and I, you know, you look around, you wonder, does anybody really know what they're saying here? Now, when you read the English, uh, you still don't quite know what you're saying, you know, because uh, what, what does this mean? What, what, why are we asking these things? So what I want to do with you is the 18 benedictions. And this is crazy what I'm going to do. I do this course at my yeshiva over, uh, once a week over an entire year. What we're going to do is, this is obviously going to be a, a tremendously distilled version. I'm just going to go over the structure of the 18 benedictions. I'm not going to go into every word of the 18 benedictions, which is referred to as the silent amida, the silent prayer. Um, but um, I teach this prayer to people who are not religious also. My, my organization, Israelite, uh, would host uh, seminars for mostly people who are unaffiliated. And one of the, like the standard core courses that I would give is going over the 18 benediction. And, and when they would ask, well, well, I don't even know if I believe in God, and even if I did believe in God, I don't know if I believe in any of this. I say, you know, if you really want to know what Judaism is about, study this prayer. Because this prayer, our sages have taken the essence of Judaism and has distilled it into this short prayer. So it's like when you're dating somebody, you want to know what do they want. If you're dating Judaism, you want to know what does Judaism want? Or what would I as a Jew want? Now, why I think this is so powerful, and I enjoy saying the 18 benedictions because I spent a lot of time working and researching to understand what we're actually saying. And when you understand what you're saying, it's really inspirational and very empowering. And, um, and essentially what you're doing with the 18 benedictions is you are discovering the power of will. Rav Soloveitchik has a, a very strong um, comment of our generation, which is <laughs> our generation, his generation, which is uh, our generation I think is even worse. He said, this is a generation of ill-willed people. People just don't know what they want. And if you don't know what you want, I want you to know there are people that are spending millions of dollars to convince you to want what they want. And they want you to buy their product. But the power of your life, literally according to Kabbalah, which is referred to as Keter, the power, the motor of your life is your willpower. 
knowing what you want and wanting that is literally the motor of your life. But most people really don't know what they want, or a lot of people know what they want, but will later on discover that it really wasn't worth wanting at all. And what's so powerful about the 18 benediction is our rabbis is giving us a very profound understanding of what's worth wanting and what has been the dream of the Jewish people. Right? Now, most people think that prayer is about trying to get God to want what we want. And that is what prayer is about, but that's not what tefillah is, which is what we do. Right? We're not trying to get God to want what we want. What do I know if what I want is the right thing to be wanting in the first place? Right? We want to want what God wants. Right? And the more I want what God wants, the more what God wants comes into my life and comes into the world. That's what this prayer is. This prayer is God's prayer. Right? This is what God, so to speak, prays for all the time if God were praying. And actually, there is a concept like that in Kabbalistic tradition as if God is praying. And so you're trying to tuning into by praying this. And so this is an exercise of will and imagination where I'm inspiring myself to dream and I'm turning my fate into destiny because fate is what's going to happen no matter what. But our joy is to turn what's going to happen no matter what into what I want to happen. Right? And embrace what Mashiach's coming no matter what. Right? In fact, the Rabbi Epstein said, or one of the rabbis said, that God willing, Mashiach will come this year, and there'll be only one teacher next year at JLI. I said to my wife, Well, they're not inviting me back. <laughs> my wife said, What do you mean? They are. <laughs> right? And well, I can't be Mashiach because I'm a Cohen. All right. But I'll, I'm still coming back for the food at least. But. Uh, all right, so let's, let's look at the 18 benedictions. It's called 18 benedictions, but you know us Jews, it's actually 19, right? <laughs> and the 19th was la added later on, and we'll talk about it when we get to it. But again, we're going to go through this very quickly. Now, I actually have um, a card, a c I call it a Kavana card, an intention card that I developed. And um, I give it to the kids in my yeshiva. You could access it uh, online to help you. Davin, and basically what I did is I, uh, and all this was, you know, selfishly also for myself, which is I wanted tefillah prayer to be meaningful for me. And so what I do here is you'll see uh, every request or every, I don't know, I don't like the word benediction. I never, <laughs> never related to that word benediction. But anyways, every prayer over here, I have like the title of the prayer. I kind of sum up what the prayer is. Hashem is loving, Hashem is all-powerful. And then I paraphrase underneath it what the text was actually saying, right? So what I did over here is I paraphrase every request. And what I recommend people do is just read that so that you prepare yourself for what you're about to say, okay? Now, the text over here is uh, Ashkenazi because I'm Ashkenazi, and therefore everyone has to be Ashkenazi, right? No, uh, just for, but, but the truth is in terms of what we're doing today, we're not going into every word. We're going into conceptually what is the theme of every request. And that's the same for no matter whether you're Hasidic or not Hasidic or Svardic or Ashkenazi. So that everybody agrees, the structure of the Shemona Esri. Now what's really amazing about this 18 benedictions is it's incredibly logical if you just think about it. But sadly enough, a lot of people aren't thinking about it. I did a talk in Toronto and a Hasidic boy showed up. I mean, but the Hasidic boy with the white socks and the pants stuck into his white socks, he seemed very out of place because I was teaching at a modern Orthodox synagogue and this very Hasidic-looking boy showed up. At the end of my talk, he said to me, you know what, I can't believe it. I have no clue what I've been saying my whole life. So he went back to his yeshiva, which is a Hasidic yeshiva. Not, it was not a Lubavitch yeshiva, but it was a Hasidic yeshiva. And it was the third meal. And he asked all his friends at the third meal, does anybody here have any clue what we say three times a day in prayer? And they all said, no. <laughs> you know, it was crazy. You wonder why we're in so much trouble Jewishly. We don't even know what we're saying. And uh, essentially, this boy uh, 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 got my book, Soul Power Prayers, and he started teaching it in his room to his friends. And then some of his ribbies started coming to hear this little boy teach over this stuff. So, but this is really the 18 benedictions, and I'm, I'm encouraging you, take your rabbi and say, I want to know what this means. I want to know what I'm saying. 
Because once you understand it, it's extremely powerful because it's an exercise of will. And knowing what you want and wanting it and wanting what Hashem wants, that's the connection. That's the power line. Okay? So the first three, um, uh, the first three, uh, I don't know what to call them, <laughs> blessings, right, are called praises. Okay? 18 benedictions are bra- is broken up into three um, sections. The first three are referred to as praises. The next uh, uh, 12 is, uh, no, the next 13 is referred to as um, requests. And the last three are referred to as thanksgiving. And you get like a turkey at the end of that, okay? And so that, that's how it's structured. So let's look at the first three, okay? The first three is Hashem is all loving, okay? You love, care for, and protect us, we pray with confidence. The first, first of all, the whole question of why am I praising God, right? I mean, like, God needs my praise. Well, you should know, and Rav Soloveitchik has a, a very beautiful article about it, how praising God is really a concession from God, right? Because really, we're insulting God. Because no matter what we're going to say, it doesn't come close to what we should have said. Uh, there's more source sheets at the back over there on the table over there. Uh, and some over here. Um, no, whatever we say about Hashem doesn't come close to what we should have said. And what we should have said is but a tiny spark of who Hashem truly is. So then why are we praising? This praise is for our sake, right? We have a teaching, and you might see it at the t- front of a lot of synagogues, know before whom it is that you stand, okay? And so praising Hashem is for us to hear. And by the way, you should know that when you pray, you're supposed to hear yourself praying, uh, even what's called the silent amida, the silent prayer, should not be completely silent. You say it in a whisper, uh, uh, low enough that it doesn't disturb the person next to you, but loud enough that you actually should hear yourself saying this. is kind of feeding you. These teachings are feeding you. The first thing you need to know, and that's what this first blessing is, and you can go over it uh, in English at another time, but the first blessing that we... Re- we, we, we um, Uh, or the first praise of God, is basically acknowledging that God loves us. I had this interesting experience. I was on the Larry King show. You still remember Larry King? So when my first first book came out, Endless Light, uh, I got a call from someone that this woman would like to speak to me. My book changed her life. I said, okay, fine, happy to meet her. And so I met with her, and I said, how'd you get my book? She said, I get books on my desk all the time. I said, what, are you a librarian? She says, no, I'm the producer of Larry King. I've been trying to get to Larry King, and the producer shows up in my office. I said, wait a second, my book changed your life? How come I'm not on Larry King? She says, because you're not a household name. I said, well, what do you mean? My name is Kleenex. What, what do you mean? <laughs> right? So she said, well, you're not a household name. And then she, I said, there must be a way to get me on. And she actually came up with an idea called a spiritual health show. And she got Deepak Chopra, Marianne Williamson, and other uh, household names, and then the non-household name, David Aaron, uh, was put on the, um, uh, you know, put part of that. So uh, Larry King, as you all probably know, is Jewish. And um, actually, he was very nice to me when I was in the green room. That's what they call the room that you're waiting for. He said to the staff there, take care of the rabbi. He's part of my tribe, right? And so uh, on the show, the, the first question that Larry asks is he turns to Deepak Chopra, who you might know is a teacher very much rooted in Hinduism, and in jest, he calls, him a hin- he calls himself a Hindu because so many of his followers are Jewish. And uh, so Larry King asks um, um, Deepak Chopra, Deepak, what's your definition of God? And Deepak downloads this metaphysical, spiritual, like the infinite realm of possibility. And I looked at him and go, whoa. <laughs> I'm sweating bricks my first time on national television. The second question is Deepak, I mean, Larry turns to me and says, Rabbi? Is he judging us? Is he watching us? Okay, my humor was about to say, well, Larry, if he wasn't watching us, this wouldn't be Larry King Live anymore. But I decided uh, to go that way. And, but I thought, well, why do I get the bad rap for God? Why does he ask me if he's judging us? So I said to him, no, Larry, he's loving us. And then he had a surprised look on his face. He turns, to, he turns to Marianne Williamson, who happens to be Jewish, best-selling author who teaches Christianity, uh, but she's Jewish. 
And uh, he says, Marianne, what does God mean to you? She said, I'm with the rabbi. God is about love. And then he asked uh, uh, Billy Graham's son who was on the, on the show. And he said, Reverend Graham, what does God mean to you? He said, I'm with the rabbi. God is about love. Right? Uh, well, anyways, uh, after that, Larry didn't ask me <laughs> any more questions. Uh, we got to the commercial, and Deepak turns to me and says, Rabbi, I love your answers. Uh, answer. <laughs> I only had one. And then Larry says, yeah, you're doing great, Rabbi. I'm thinking, I've said nothing. I have said nothing of any intelligence. And then I realized that I said the most crazy thing that came out of the mouth of an Orthodox Jew. I said, God loves us. You know? And it's so funny because people call me, and I was walking down the street a couple months ago, and this girl comes up and she says, oh, you're the love rabbi. Right? I said, the love rabbi? I hate people. <laughs> I said, well, I'm the, well, I'm the love rabbi. She said, well, you're the rabbi that talks about God loving us all the time. I'm the rabbi that talks about it. Look at your prayer every day. Ava, rabbi, avtotani. With a great love you loved us. Ava, tolam, an eternal love you love us. The first blessing of the Torah, the first blessing that we say, the first praise is we recognize that this is a God, that God loves cares, protects us so we can pray with confidence. Who are you talking to? If you don't believe that God cares about you, then there's no way to start to pray, right? And for those of you that were in my talk, uh, you know, last night, and for those of you who were not, then you are being cursed. No, God forbid, <laughs> right? For those of you who were at my class last night, then, then you know that, of course, God loves you. How can God not love a part of himself, Right? Because Kabbalah teaches that you are a soul, and a soul is literally a facet of God, right? And surely I would never forsake even my little pinky, right? So how could you think that God not? So, so when you pray, you need to stand before Hashem, knowing that Hashem cares, loves, protects, right? And not only that, I didn't put there, but it says the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the, God's reputation is completely bound up with us. People say, oh, wait, I know you. You're the God of Abraham. You're the God of Isaac, right? So surely God is deeply vested in our... And so if you don't think that, you can't even begin to open up your mouth. So the first praise is God loves and cares for us and will protect us. The next one is God is all-powerful, right? Because it's very nice if you believe that God cares, but what if he can't deliver? Now, there was a book written many years ago that became a bestseller uh, by a, I think he's a reform rabbi, by the name of uh, Rabbi Kushner. Wrote a book called Why Bad Things Happen, or actually When Bad Things Happen to Good People. And it became a very famous book. How many of you have heard of this book? Well, you should just know that he changed his mind many years later <laughs> on his conclusions in that book. Because, and I'm not judging him. Uh, but he, his son uh, was, uh, had a, a terrible disease, uh, a rapid aging disease, and he witnessed his son rapidly age and die. And he was challenged by, you know, how do these things happen to good people, especially a little boy? What sins could he have, you know, committed? And so he struggled with that personally, and in his book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, he goes through classic Jewish answers to the question of God and bad things happening to good people. And essentially concluded in the book, from what I remember, is uh, either God is good or God is all-powerful. But he can't be both, right? Because if God is good and all-powerful, then why is all this bad happening? Why isn't he stopping it, right? And if God is um, all-powerful, so basically his conclusion is that God is good but not all-powerful. That was the conclusion of his book. He later on, in a book that came out a couple of years ago, he retracts that, right? But it's in our prayer. We believe that God is all good, all caring, all loving, and we believe that God is all powerful. And so, of course, we don't understand, you know, why is it that horrible things are happening? Surely God could intervene and stop that, right? But as I mentioned last night, it's important to understand that no matter what pain we're going through, God is literally going through that pain with us. Literally going through that pain with us. So at the very least, you know, you can say, well, why isn't God stopping this happening to me? Well, you have an even better question. Why is God not stopping this happening to a part of himself? 
And that's a long discussion, which, by the way, my book, especially this particular book, The Secret Life of God, goes into that very issue of life being difficult and the challenges that we're facing and God's uh, involvement in that. But the second praise, and again, I'm not going into the words, but I really recommend take your rabbits and your rabbi and say, I want to go through these words because literally this is an exercise that will change your life. Okay? So the second thing is that God is all-powerful, so God cares and can deliver, right? And then the third is that God is all-wondrous. Atah kadosh v'shim kadosh means you are beyond, right? You are beyond anything I could say. I could say you're loving. I could say you're all-powerful. But the truth is that no matter what I say, will never exhaust the truth of who you are. Okay, And then I have to remind myself that whatever I'm praising the divine, I have to understand that the divine is much greater than anything we say. And that's why it says, and, and the Kedoshim, uh, Yulu Chasel, and the Holy Ones forever praise you. There's never a time that you could, you know, exhaust the praise of God. And again, all of this is not for God's sake. All this is to live with a sense of wonderment, right? And that's the sad thing, you know. Walking down the street, we should be every day blown away, right? I learned this from my son when he was a little, little boy walking down the street, and he points to the sky, and he saw a bird flying across the sky. And he said, Abba, Daddy, Ze, that. And he pointed to the bird. Ah, this is my opportunity as an adult to teach my son, you know, words. I said, that's a bird. Say bird. And my little boy said, bird. I said, oh, great, look at me, you know. And then another one flew by. And he said, Daddy, look, that. And I said to him, that's also a bird. And I saw the confusion in his eyes when he looked at me like, how could they both be birds? And I realized I'm not seeing reality anymore. I'm putting these labels on these creatures, right? He, that's not a bird. That's something so different, so new, so amazing. And I taught him to lose his ability to see with wonder as if he's never seen it before. That's children. They look at the world as if they never saw it before. And we, I saw that before, right? So that's the idea. A prophet, unlike most people, they hear what they've heard and they see what they've seen. A prophet has the ability to always hear as if it's the first time and see as if it's the first time. A takadosh is to realize, whoa, no matter what I say about the divine, you're beyond anything I could say. So these first three blessings set up the stage for whom, before whom you stand. You are standing before Hashem, who is all loving, who is all powerful, and was all wondrous. Right? So that's the first three. All right. All right. That was three hours of classes that I give in the yeshiva, but not for today. Okay. So now we're going into the requests. Okay. Number four on page three. The f so first of all, you should just know that all the requests correlate to the desire for tshuva, the desire to come back to ourselves as an individual, as a community, right? As the Jewish people, to come back to our land, to bring mankind back to God, and to bring God back to the world. That's the entire theme of the 18 benedictions. It's really built on the desire for tshuva, of returning to ourselves as individuals, as a community, as a nation, as a, as a universe, and, and then we actually, actually ask for God to come back to the world. We pray, so to speak, for God. Right? So the first request, before we make those requests, is the ability to request in the first place. And that is called dot. When we ask God to give us dot, that means that we should be mindful and connected to what we are praying for. Right? So the first prayer, the first request, is a request to be able to request, right? Because that's what dot is, and that's what really Chabad is. Chachma bina v'dat is Chabad, and Chachma is visionary thinking. Bina is strategic thinking, but dot is when you really get it, right? You, you get, you, you know what you want, and you want it, right? That's why in Kabbalah Keter, which is will, is never counted with dot, because dot is just will process where you really want what you want. You, you've got the vision, you've got the strategy, and you say, yes, I get it. That's what I want. So this first blessing is we are asking God to bless us with the power to really want 
And as I mentioned before, this is why so many people are so not anchored in their lives, because they don't know what they want, or they do know what they want, but what they want is not worth wanting, or they just live in this world where they just go with the flow of what anybody's selling them, have never really sat down to think about, what do I want? And this is getting worse. I mean, I teach teenagers, and I told them that, you know, you don't contemplate. When I was a kid, if, if I had a problem in my life, and I had plenty of challenges, especially growing up in a non-Jewish neighborhood, I was beat up for killing Jesus. Uh, I told them, I don't even know the kid. I never played with him. <laughs> right? right? So... So I, I had to contemplate. I had to contemplate. Uh, and I couldn't run to the television because the shows that I liked weren't on demand. And I didn't have a little television in my pocket that I could look at whatever I want to and distract myself. We're in a world that is constantly avoiding problems. And when you avoid problems, you avoid life because life is about growing. Right? Dot is to develop what do I want, Right? Because I'm having problems in my life because every problem that God gives you in your life is an opportunity to get in touch with, is this what I want? Or maybe this is Hashem telling me you're wanting what's not worth wanting and this is not a problem, this is an opportunity to get out and get on with your life. So the first request, which I could do a whole hour on this request, is learning to ask God. Bless, we, bless me with the mindfulness and the clarity to know what I want and know how to pray. To really want that. Because that's the power of prayer. You don't have to convince God. Hashem only wants to and always wants to give you the best. He's just waiting for you to want the best. Right? And you don't want the best. And so many people are spending so much time wanting what they will realize later on. Right? Wasn't worth wanting. You probably all have heard the story about this multimillionaire who left an envelope before he passed away and said, please don't read this envelope until I pass away. And in the envelope, right, <clears throat> in his little will, is he asked that he be buried in his favorite socks. And they couldn't believe it. That's what he asked. This multimillionaire asked to be buried in his favorite socks, and he has directions exactly where his, famous so his, his, his favorite socks are located. Right? Well, this is unusual because according to Jewish law, you cannot be buried in your socks. So the, par the kids didn't understand. This was a man, a religious man. He went to the rabbi. I said, Rabbi, I don't know what to do. My father has left an envelope asking that he be buried in his favorite socks. And the rabbi said, I'm sorry, right? right? I'm sorry, but um, he can't do it. Right. Well, at the end of the letter, it says, open up the next envelope. So there was another envelope. And in that envelope, it says, you see, you can be a multimillionaire and you can't even bury, be buried with your favorite socks. Right. So what do you really want to be buried with in the first place? And so th that's why I just love this 18 benedictions. This is about what do you want? This is what Jewish people want. And I believe that when you go through this, you will realize this, this is really what I should dream about every single day. So the first thing I want is the, ab the ability to want, which is dot. The next thing I want is number five, return us to our mission, right? Guide us back to, life of, to a life of truth, service, and penitence. That's really the, the, um, the, the, the paraphrase of that request. Right? Hashaveinu vinu Torah Bring us back to your Torah. Bring us back to your service. Bring us back to complete tshuva where we're really being true to our real selves. Because that is what you should want. Right? Is to live a life that is dedicated to truth, to service, and returning to your essence. And that's what you should every day say and ask and pray and dream for. So that's the second request, which I told you is really the, you could call this kind of like the heading of all the requests. Because all the, uh, the uh, upcoming requests is really subsets of that ultimate request. Is the desire to do tshuva. And the desire to do tshuva means to come back to myself as a human being, to come back to myself as a, as a Jew, to come back to myself as a member of the Jewish people, to come back to myself as a servant and a channel for God's presence in the world, and when you got that, you got everything, right? And you can have the biggest house in the world. I mean, I was working in Hollywood. I was meeting actors and actresses. And, and it was amazing how they have so much and feel so little, right? And it's surprising 
You know, it's surprising. Uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, I mentioned I'd, I'd been studying with Kirk Douglas. He used to fly me to Los Angeles every six weeks to study with him for an entire week, five hours a day, right? And so he had mentioned this to some other people that he knew in Hollywood. And uh, he said there's this, there's this person, that's a uh, woman that's about to get the Oscar. Everybody knew she was going to get the Oscar for the best, uh, the best movie. And he called her up. He said, you know, um, you know, I think you should meet my rabbi. So she said, oh, yeah, yeah. I get in the car. She picks me up. She gets in the car. The first thing she says to me is, who else are you studying with in Hollywood? I said, whoa, boy, are you weak, right? That's why you wanted to meet me, right? Because who else are you studying with in Hollywood, right? And I realized that I was in their home, and, and it, I mean, amazing home. I just saw, you know what? If you don't have yourself, you can live in a mansion, but you are a pauper, right? But until you're at home in yourself and come back to yourself, it just doesn't matter what you put around you because what's inside you is weak or even empty. And so that's this request. And you should meditate. By the way, I say these requests not only when I pray, but also when I exercise. Yes, once a year when I exercise. <laughs> no, actually, when I do exercise on my treadmill, which Leanna and I, I try to do very regularly, I see these blessings without God's name, but they become my mantra. They become my consciousness. This is what I want. I want to come back to my mission. I want to live truth. I want to be in service, and I want to come back to who I really am. Right? And there's nothing more important. That should be your, that's what it should be your life about. Right? That's what you want. Okay, so then once I've established what is the theme of my life, it's to come back to myself to, be, to, to, be, to live truth and be in service. So then the next request, of course, is the first step in repentance is forgiveness. So the next request in number six is I am asking Hashem to forgive me for my mistakes. And basically we're saying in that request in Hebrew, but I paraphrase it, we violated your love. Forgive us. Pardon the consequences. Okay? And so the first step in any relationship, whether it's with yourself or with others or with God, is to seek forgiveness. You know, there was this movie called Love Story. I'm dating myself. Did anybody see Love Story? Right? Well, okay. So you have class. Okay. <laughs> right? I didn't even see it. Uh, <laughs> but I remember that because it became like this best-selling movie. And then everybody was like quoting it. And then So there was this quote that came out of the movie, which is, love means never saying sorry. Okay, and that was on like on Valentine cards and things. It became like like the first commandment. Love means never say sorry. Guess what? Right. That is the stupidest advice I've ever heard. Right. If there's anybody you're going to have to say sorry to, it is your spouse. Right. Because the closer you are to a person, the more you're going to step on their toes. Okay. That is just the fact of life. And therefore, the first step is learn how to say sorry. So I'm working with this couple in Los Angeles, this very famous couple. And, in, and uh, I was having breakfast, and the wife sits beside me. She wasn't studying with us. She didn't want to study with us. And she turns to me. She says, you know what's wrong with my husband? I'm having uh, Rice Krispies right now. <laughs> I don't really want to know. But, right before I had a chance to say, you know, crack, snapple, pop, I, she said, he doesn't know how to ask for forgiveness. He doesn't know how to ask for forgiveness. And she begins to tell me a story. A story about how he doesn't know how to apologize. I said to her, well, when did that happen? 30 years ago. 30 years ago. That's the only story she could come up with. 30 years ago. That same day, I'm sitting with this guy, and we're learning Torah. Out of nowhere, he says, you know what bugs me about my wife? Right? I said, it's not the Rice Krispies, I bet. Right? He says, she doesn't know how to forgive. She does not know how to forgive. He begins to tell me the same story. 30 years ago, right? Get over it. Get on, right? And so the first request is to know that God forgives. This is one of the biggest problems I think people grow up in the Jewish world. They don't believe that Hashem forgives. That's one of the most amazing things about Judaism is we believe in an incredibly forgiving God, but do tshuva, regret what you did, accept upon yourself you won't do it again, and done. And get on with your life. Get on with your life. Don't hold on to it. God is not holding on to it. 
Yeah? And I believe that people are punishing themselves, and God is saying, could you stop that? Right? Who asked you to be, you know, my administrator? Right? I'm not punishing you. I think a lot of people are living in their own lack of forgiveness. So turn to Hashem and say, ask for forgiveness. I regret what I did. I accept him upon myself. I, I recognize my mistake. I regret it. I wish I didn't do that. And I don't want to do that again. Help me not to do that again. I don't want to do that again. Gone. First step in coming back to yourself, coming back to your people, coming back to your purpose, coming back to God. Then the next request after asking for forgiveness, is redeem us from personal exile. We are afflicted by our ungodly acts. Estranged from our true self. Restore our self-respect. You see, when you make a mistake, when you do something ungodly, you've not only violated your relationship with God, you have violated yourself. You have compromised your integrity. You have lost yourself in your ego. You are in a personal exile. That's what this next request is all about. This actually is one of my favorite requests, right? Because we are afflicted by our ungodly acts. What does that mean? It means deep inside, you're so good. You cannot but be good. But on the outside, you might be acting like a total jerk. And the punishment is that disconnect between who you really are and the way you're coming across. You know, what you're thinking and what you're saying and what you're doing just does not match who you are. And that is a terrible sense of isolation, alienation from yourself. Essentially, this request is asking God to restore our self-worth. Because when a person behaves in an ungodly way, they are defying and they are betraying their greatness. Right? And this is a world that is so afraid of their greatness that we are playing it down. We are denying our greatness. We think that by saying I'm, you know, I'm nothing, I absolve myself of the responsibility and the guilt of not living up to greatness. But it won't work, you know. And one of the things that really, really disturbs me are tattoos, right? And one of the reasons why tattoos I find very, very disturbing especially some of the tattoos, what people will put on their bodies, you know? What people will put on their bodies, I mean, on the plane a little while ago, I was sitting beside a fellow, and all over his body were dead skulls, right? And that's what you put on your body, right? Right? That's what you put on your body. So I heard this one comedian said, when people ask me, when are you going to put on a tattoo? He says, as soon as I put a bumper sticker on my Mercedes Benz, right? And if your Mercedes Benz... You wouldn't put a bumper sticker on your Mercedes-Benz. Why are you putting tattoos on your body? Right? And I think this is a society that is teaching us to disregard our incredible value. Right? Disregard our incredible value. And so, uh, you know, I say to teenagers, I say, you know, getting drunk is getting trashed or getting wasted. Right? At least you're honest. Right? Because you're treating yourself like trash. You're wasting yourself. So at least you're honest about what you're doing. What could be fun about doing something that is betraying your godly greatness? And so when a person does something ungodly, what they're essentially doing is they've not only violated their relationship with God, they have violated themselves. Right? And that's a lot harder to f heal. Right? To say to God, forgive me, but now I have to say to myself, forgive me. How could I do this to myself? How could I, how could I do that? So that's the next request. Redeem us from personal exile. I have exiled myself. I have lost my ground. I am not in my place. I am misplaced in my life. Then the next request, we start transitioning into tshuva for the nation. This has been until now focusing of ourselves coming back to God. But now... We are talking about ourselves coming back to God with our nation coming back to God. And it's important to understand that when a person does something ungodly, they are damaging their nation, not just yourself. Because you're a member of the Jewish people. And every one of us is connected. And so, Kabbalistically, if you go up, you take everyone up with you. And when you go down, you take us all down with you. And so the whole nation... And it's very hard for people to believe this.
But every good act is literally impacting the entire Jewish people this very second. We're that connected to each other. And so the next request is we ask for the healing of your nation. Because when a person is living an ungodly life, they are unhealthy. You not only violate the duration of God, you not only betrayed your greatness, you're not healthy. Because healthy people don't think that way, don't talk that way, don't act that way. And you're making our nation unhealthy. Okay, so this next request for healing is not just healing for ourselves as individuals, but also it's about healing your nation. So that's the next request. The request after that, so we're starting to transition from personal redemption and tshuva to national redemption and tshuva. And now we talk about number nine. So we've asked for our nation to become healthy. The next step is that our nation should go back home, okay? So the first request is the power to request. The second request is the desire and the foundation, the root of all requests to come back to God, to ourselves, right? The next request is forgiveness. The next request is for personal redemption and restoration of self-worth. The next request is that our nation become healthy and strong. And then the next request is we should go home, right? You know, like that Israel parade in New York City? Well, we should be parading ourselves onto an airline, LL, and go home, right? That's eventually where we want to go. And that's when we'll be completely healthy. So the next request is to store, restore the land's prosperity. Because the prophet says that before the Jewish people will come back, the land of Israel will come back to its prosperity. So the next request is a request where we're asking that the land of Israel be fertile again as it prepares itself for the ingathering of the Jewish people, okay? And then after that, it makes sense that we ask Hashem to take us home. And that's the next request. Return us proudly to our homeland with fanfare and celebration. That's really the request of number 10. Then, of course, okay, we're coming back. Our nation's healthy. The land is preparing itself and being fertile in its produce for us to come back. Right, that's the amazing thing when you go to the land of Israel. We have been able to take a desert and turn desert land into agriculture. That's unbelievable. You can you read the account of Mark Twain. Mark Twain actually went to Israel on a birthright trip. No, I'm just joking. Mark Twain went on a trip, and he actually paid for his own ticket. And, uh, and he writes a horrible thing about what a desolate country this is. No man would want to be here. That's what the land of it. You go there today and you see, you know, read the book, Startup Nation. I mean, walking the streets of Jerusalem, I'm so blessed to be there. It's like I'm living the miracle. I'm living the miracle. My partner, Rabbi Benny Friedman, he does these tours. And in the center square of the old city, he says, you know, if your grandfather, great-grandmother, would appear right now and see us here, they would have asked, when did Mashiach come? He must have come already. Okay, well, so he hasn't come yet, but things are in a great direction. We are coming home, okay? We are coming home. So that's the next request that we ask to come home, but proudly. Because a lot of people went back to Israel because we, we ran. We had to run, right? We want to go back to Israel not because we were running away from the exile, but because we're running home to where we all belong, okay? Homeward bound. And then we go to number 11. Okay, land's ready, the people coming back. Obviously, what's the next thing we need? We need a Jewish state, but a Jewish state. And so we say, remove the misery of anarchy and tyranny. Kindly and compassionately reign supreme. Vindicate our rights. And that's a paraphrase of the next request, that the nation should now be a nation. Because this is the mistake that a lot of Jewish people think. We think we're a religion. We're much more than a religion. We're a people. And our goal is to not only enjoy personal redemption, but to establish a state that will be a model state for all of mankind, right? That's what the land of Israel and the state of Israel is meant to be. That people will look at the state and say, wow, that's the state of the art state, right? And that's how we have to live our lives. Because, you know, there's a teaching the Romans would say, let that which is be Caesar's be Caesar's and let that which is God be God. And this whole separation of church and state that, you know, you don't, don't bring God into politics, right? 
Well, actually, Judaism is saying that God belongs everywhere, not just in your home, not just your kashrus, but how we run a government, how we set up a political system, and that God says, let us be, be the king of this state. Okay, now here comes the 19th request that was put in later on. Protect national independence. Protect us from those who threaten Torah life and national independence. Eliminate evil. Subdue your enemies. That's the next request and was brought in later on. And what inspired the rabbis to add this later on, which is so shocking, you think if any rabbis would get together to come up with a prayer that Jews would say, the first prayer they would come up with would be to get rid of our enemies. I mean, if I was sitting there and writing a prayer, which prayer? I mean, that'd be one of the first things on my list. And it wasn't on our list because we're just not a hateful people. We're not a vengeful people. We want to focus on the positive, right? But it got to a point that our enemies were internal. And so this prayer was actually inspired by the fact that we had Jews that were traitors. And they looked like religious Jews, and they looked like they were on our side. So the rabbis realized that we have to build the consciousness of the people to be aware of these insiders. There are enemies amongst us. It's one thing outside of us, but this is so much more serious, the ones inside. So this next request was written, and the rabbis tried to find who could write a prayer like this, you know, something to eliminate evil and subdue our enemies. And I think I could do a great job on that, but I wasn't picked. And I wonder, like, well, couldn't anybody come up with a prayer like that? But they could only find one rabbi referred to as Shmuel HaKatan. Why was he the only one that they felt was able to write this prayer? Because Shmuel HaKatan, referred to as Little Shmuel, is known, one of the things he's known for teachings is do not rejoice in the downfall of your enemies in Perkei Avot. Oh, well, he can write this prayer. Because we don't want this prayer to be written from a place of hate for people but from a place of love for God because we don't want to ever hate people and it saddens us. It deeply, deeply saddens us to have to ask for this, but we have to ask for this. So this prayer was added in later on that once our state has been established, we're asking for the removal of those people that challenge and are a threat to the state. And now we ask for support for spiritual leadership, which is very interesting Right? which is actually how the modern state of Israel has evolved. Because it really started as a secular state, and now the amount of Torah learning in Eretz Israel is just remarkable. The center of Torah learning is now coming out of the land of Israel. And so it's interesting that first things start kind of materially, physically, secularly, and then it becomes infused with spirituality and soulfulness. So the next request is we ask Hashem to establish spiritual leadership in the land. Now that spiritual leadership, so there we are. We've asked for ourselves to return. We're asking for our nation to return. And now we begin to ask for the world to return because that's the next request, 14. We ask for the reestablishment of Jerusalem. Restore your presence to Jerusalem. Establish there the throne of David, right? What is the throne of David, right? That is headquarters, Mashiach headquarters is Jerusalem, and we are beginning to now turn our eyes towards bringing the world back to God. And that's the next request. Then number 15 is accelerate the coming of Mashiach, glorified by your salvation, because it's your salvation we daily yearn for, right? The next request, we ask for Mashiach. Now, it's interesting. Mashiach is coming more for the world than us, right? Of course, Mashiach is coming for us, but when we ask for Mashiach, we're talking about World perfect, right? We want Mashiach now, not just for us, but for the whole world. Because Mashiach will bring peace to all of mankind. So, of course, that's the next request. And then, after we've asked for that, we have an interesting request. We ask us to hear our prayers. Assure us that you're listening. Lovingly accept our prayers. Send us not empty-handed away. Okay, this is very interesting because we're kind of starting to climax with our requests, right? And our climax of our requests is that we should feel that you're listening, right? That we have, we've asked for ourselves to come back, the nation to come back. We've asked for, the, for, for Mashiach to come to bring mankind back, right? But God, please, after all these requests, maybe we're not going to see an answer, but just give us a little sign that you're listening, Right? That's that next request. And then we ask for God. 
We are now praying for God. We've prayed that we come back, our communities come back, the nation come back, mankind come back, and now we're asking God to come back. That's in number 17, page 6. Restore the temple offerings. Right, Bless us to literally see your presence return to Zion. We have come back to you. We're ready. Please come back to us. We're actually praying for God. Okay, And now the last three is we are thanking God, which is really very interesting. Because in the thanking of God, you would think, well, if you're thanking God for all the great things that happened, then why did you have all these requests in the first place? And that's a Jew. Uh, a Jew is on one hand, we have these requests, but we don't forget, right? We don't forget how thankful we should be for what we already have, okay? And then the last request really ultimately is we ask for peace. And our rabbis teach us that without peace, you have nothing, right? You can have a great home, you can have a great job, you, have, you know, but if you don't have inner peace, if you don't have peace in your community, if there's no peace in the world, then we don't have a vessel to hold the blessings. It's like it's raining and you don't have a pail. And therefore, the last re really request of the 18 benedictions is we ask for peace. To sum it all up, this should be your wish list. Every day, this should be the context of your life. Anything you're looking for and wanting for and dreaming about should be a subset in one of these requests. The first request is, first of all, live with a sense that God loves you, that God protects you, and God is all wondrous. And then want to learn how to want. Pray to know how to pray, right? And then pray to come back to God, to yourself, to your mission, to your service. Ask for forgiveness. Restore your self-respect, right? Ask for the healing of your people. Ask for the restoration of the land. Ask for the people to come back to the land. Ask for the nation to be reestablished as a nation. Ask for the restoration of the spiritual leadership to the nation. Ask for the restoration of Jerusalem as the spiritual epicenter of the, of the, of the Mashiach coming to the world. Ask for Mashiach to come, right? And ask for Hashem to give you a little sign that what you're asking for is not falling on Deaf ears. Ask for Hashem to come back to this world. And what does it mean for Hashem to come back to this world? It means that the world is filled with the godly presence of goodness, of kindness, of compassion. And literally, it says literally, we literally see the presence of God in the world, whatever that means, because God doesn't look like you and me, right? But we will literally see the presence of God and then focus on being thankful and then ask for the final request which is the request that will hold all the other requests in place, which is ask for inner peace, family peace, communal peace, world peace. Bless us with the blessing of your face, it says, right? Bless us with the light of your face, that I look around the room and I see the light of God's face on every human being. And then we will have come back home. This is the most amazing prayer. It is literally an exercise. You know, meditation is really very powerful. But meditation is generally about emptying ourselves out. This is about filling ourselves up. Fill yourself with the dream. God's dream for a world that has come back to itself. For God's presence to come back to us. And a world of peace where we can hold all those blessings in our lives. Thank you so much. What did you think about this video? Comment below and click subscribe for more videos like this.